Um, welcome, everybody. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on the topic knowing inequality and social justice research as a way to start off our seminar. And it's my great privilege and honor to introduce two people who I love and who I've learned so much from and with over the years. Um, Michelle and Maria are uh, my mentors and comrades in arms. And for many of us, the work they do, along with the Public Science Project, is about reclaiming the relevance of the of um, scholarship. Their cutting edge work engages critical questions about the purpose and audiences of research. Who is scholarship for? What changes when those who are most affected by the research uh, are asking the questions? Who has the right to research? And how can we, in uh, Paolo Freire's words, move beyond an armchair revolution? Dr. Michelle Fine is Distinguished Professor of Psychology, Urban Education, and Women's Studies here at the Graduate Center, and her work has focused on participatory action research um, and the circuits of dispossession and resistance in schools, communities, and prisons. Uh, her work focuses on social change and educational justice. She has written so many books. Um, the first, Framing Dropouts, flips the gaze to consider the critique of educational institutions from the perspective of students who have left. And this is the hallmark of her critical feminist uh, scholarship and amplifications of those perspectives that have been silenced or delegitimized. A later book um, that she collaborated on with Maria Torre, um, Echoes of Brown, um, a participatory action research project, looks at the resegregation of schools 50 years after the landmark uh, decision and the ways in which structural racism has informed the, um, the opportunity gap, so reframing the achievement gap. To her work, she brings what uh, she and Lois Weiss identify as a critical bifocality, an analysis that considers both the structures or circuits of inequality and their lived experience. Michelle has written many books, countless articles, and reading her work is like drinking fresh water because of the clear, fluid way that she writes about people's lives. So we're delighted that you're joining us today. Um, Maria Torre is the founding director of the Public Science Project here at the Graduate Center of CUNY. For more than 10 years, she has conducted participatory action research nationally and internationally with schools, prisons, and community-based organizations. Her work has introduced the concept of participatory contact zones, asking how might we build a radically inclusive we, from which to build knowledge, relationships, and policies that interrupt social injustice. I find myself turning to Maria's work again and again because of the thoughtful, critical ways that she engages critical, complex questions of difference and solidarity, keeping the analysis complicated and thick, drawing upon borderland scholarship, critical race, and feminist theories. Um, in a moment, you're going to learn more about the Public Science Project, but just a few words to say how this is a labor of love for Maria, and um, Maria and Michelle have envisioned and created and shepherded the Public Science Project um, over the years, drawing many of us into the field to create one of the most vibrant research centers um, in CUNY that is active in most boroughs, working with and not on or for communities. Um, the Public Science Project is itself building a social movement to shift and reimagine the academy and to transform the ways in which we conceptualize and do research and know and understand and act to challenge inequalities. So thank you so much for everything that you've done and for joining us tonight. Thank you. And so we begin? And so we begin. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. Um, it's really an honor to be here. This course is uh, <laughs> this course is a concert of sorts <laughs> with harmonies and disharmonies and lots of audiences. Um, I guess I um, I'm going to frame what we do with the Public Science Project and um, some of the commitments that we bring to community-based research. As I understand it, part of the requirement of this course is that people engage in community-based research. So we're going to give you the thin outlines and then feel free to email or tweet or call me at home or <laughs> stop me in the bathroom, um, for those of you who can. Um, I'm currently writing a paper. It's a letter to Audre Lorde. I often write to people who are no longer with us. And I'm. Um, I, it, it kind of says... Come on, Audrey, it's our house too. You know the piece that she wrote on, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. And so the question is, what does it mean today in 2013 
particularly in a public university, our university, a university paid for by taxpayer dollars, a university under siege um, financially with disinvestment, and uh, most recently, for those of you who are connected to Brooklyn College, you'll know the city council asked the Brooklyn College Political Science Department to disinvite two speakers who were invited to talk about um, the BDS movement and Palestinian rights. Um, so intellectually and politically and financially, we are a system under siege. And what's great about CUNY is we know how to fight back. Um, so I'm particularly committed to thinking about what's it mean to be part of a social movement of activists, researchers, working from within a university setting that views the university as part of community struggle. So my historic heroes are people like Jane Addams and W.E.B. Du Bois and Miles Horton and Kurt Lewin, many of whom were involved in creating community-based activist research collectives, almost all of which were not in the academy. Mm. And the hypothesis I want to prove wrong is that you can't sustain the vibrancy of this work with activist colleagues in the academy. I do not want to think that we can be cleansed out. So a lot of our work is about troubling the borders of what constitutes scholarship and what constitutes action. And a lot of our work is about what we would consider the debt of the public university to advance issues of social justice and to speak and study the unsayable. Does that make sense as a frame? Can you, can you bear another five minutes? Good. Um, so the work that more centrally, Maria and I and Caitlin and Wendy and Sonia and many people around this room are engaged in is what we call critical participatory action research. There is a long and dedicated history of such work in psychology and sociology and geography, even in political science, in anthropology, and it usually gets cleansed out of the histories of those pro of those discipline. So a lot of Maria's work has been excavating the history of critical participatory action research in our field. I want to talk about seven commitments that we bring to the work. Um, if you go online to the Public Science Project, you'll find a whole set of readings that are available to people that will give you images of this kind of work. But the seven commitments for today that I want to talk about. First commitment is, um, has to do with a deep epistemological commitment to participation and the recognition that expertise is widely distributed even if legitimacy is not. More specifically, we begin with the assumption that people who have most experienced injustice have a deep, intimate, and embodied knowledge of injustice that is rarely recognized as a legitimate base for conducting research. So we are very committed to bringing around the table a participatory collective of individuals to help shape the research and the commitments of the research. So the first commitment is participation. We can talk to you about how we do that, but mostly in simple terms, we create research camps where we sit around with very different people and everybody contributes the piece they understand best and together we develop a language, set of methods, and an understanding about the problem we're investigating. Whether that's the rights of undocumented students to education or the rights of women and men in prison to college education or the scar tissue created in communities by stop and frisk or the needs of women who are experiencing violence but don't have the documents with which to go to the police. Right? It's a range of projects. So the first commitment is participation. The, the second commitment is that we're interested in what Jessica Ruglis and I have called theoretically circuits of dispossession and resistance. And by circuits, what we mean to signal is that um, it's not just that some groups of people are being denied access to higher ed, but when some groups are denied access to higher ed, there are economic consequences, child rearing consequences, health consequences, criminal justice consequences, housing consequences. So the consequences of a single policy, what's your SAT score, 
bleeds across sectors. That's one version of circuits. A second version of circuits is that some people's privilege is deeply dependent on other people's marginalization. So when schools get good on the Upper West Side because suddenly there are more resources and they are selecting some kids in, they're selecting other kids out, right? Does that make sense? So, that, so the second commitment is that we're not studying a problem as it is defined as a problem, like diabetes or obesity or domestic violence in this zip code, but we're understanding how those issues are circuited across a city that's deeply grounded in inequality. Does that make sense? So the unit of analysis shifts from the given problem to a much broader analysis of who's served by stop and frisk? Who's making money off of high stakes testing and who's paying a price? How has mass incarceration devastated some communities, right? Rather than saying, oh my God, it's so sad that some children have incarcerated parents, which is a piece of work we must attend to. But we have to ask these broader questions, so we're jumping scale. So that's the second commitment. I'm still on number two. <laughs> the third commitment is that everybody has a right to research. Research is not a privileged enterprise. And in fact, we are, we are radically committed to democratizing the right and the entitlement to inquiry, particularly inquiry in one's own community but even inquiry in others' communities. Young people who have been pushed out of high school have a right to investigate what is a fancy high school in Westchester County look like. They have a right to reanalyze NYPD data and ask, how come there are so many police in my neighborhood if you're picking up the same number of guns in the Bronx as you are on the east side, but you're stopping us at rates that are 10 and 20 times greater than you are stopping them? So this right to research is not just a rhetorical notion. It suggests that particularly people who have been excluded from the academy have a right to research and have a right to challenge research, and that those of us who have been privileged by the academy need to be wary of what Thomas Teo calls epistemological violence, that is, research that represents communities in disparaging, demeaning, and victim-blaming ways. That's the third, okay? I'm on number four. Number four comes to you from Maria Torre, um, which is a really brilliant concept that she has developed for us and with us, which is that research is in some ways most powerful and I would add most valid when it is developed by what she calls a contact zone of folks. That is people who are deeply, intimately affected and outsiders, and people of hybrid identities. So when we do work on stop and frisk, it might involve young people and old community members and former police officers and bodega owners and lawyers and researchers and public health, because together we bring very different knowledges to the table. There are some folks, I should say, even at the um, Public Science Project, who are not so into the contact idea are like, we need to do research in our own communities, thanks a lot. That's also a position worth holding onto. It's not, it's not my preference, but I really get it. Certainly Yasser Payne, who's done work with men who lead a street life, is really interested in doing work with that community themselves and happy to connect with us and present to us. But the idea of contact, Eve Tuck, who's um, native, would tell you, you know, contact just reminds me of white people counting my grandmother's ribs and putting her blood in the museum. So you can do your contact work and we'll do our in-community work. So that's a, that's a debate worth having, but it's an interesting one. My fifth, and I'm gonna run through this now quickly because Maria's got lots to tell you, is that we try to do research in place and across place. That is, we don't want to split off the notion that one can do deep ethnographic or statistical research in a community. That needs to happen to understand the local texture. But part of what the Public Science Project does so beautifully is then connecting those communities to see what are the similar dynamics that are operating across and what are the particularities in place. 
Does that make sense? So the, Cindy Katz has developed the notion of a counter topography to look at how issues operate across place. In some ways, we're, we're in a similar argument. So when we were working with colleagues in Detroit and all of a sudden they were closing all these schools, it seemed really important to bring advocates and researchers from Detroit together with folks from Cleveland together with folks from Newark and Philadelphia. And it took very different forms in very different places. And everybody was studying school closings in their neighborhoods. But last weekend, 18 cities marched down to Washington to bring a lawsuit simply to say one thing we have in common is this is happening in our poorest, blackest communities. And it's disproportionately disrupting the educations of black Latino kids and black and Latino educators. So this notion of working deeply in place and across places also a commitment. And then, and then I guess the last one, maybe it was six, who knows, um, is that we think a lot about who owns the research and what are the actions that come out of the research. What are the products, what are the actions, um, and what are the consequences. And lots of the advocates that we work with are very interested in research that'll take you to Albany and Washington um, or Geneva, right, to fight the big fights. Other communities are just about doing research in community to make visible a set of injustices that are otherwise underground. So when we do work with undocumented women experiencing violence in their community who can't call the cops and get an order of protection, their issue probably isn't going to Albany to knock on doors to get more police protection, but it is to make visible within the Orthodox Jewish, the Arab, the Latina, the Korean, the Japanese, the Ecuadorian communities to raise the visibility so that women and male allies can begin to work together on these issues. So the question of who owns it and what's the action, that's our seventh commitment. Okay, Maria. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so the images that have been behind Michelle are um, images from across many of our projects. Um, and they'll be rolling and repeating, so sort of if you miss them, you can glance up as you like. Um, I'm going to interrupt it now just to take you um, inside a moment of a project. I'm going to spend some time um, grounding what Michelle talked about um, and introduced in a project called the Morris Justice Project. Um, that has been looking at um, a com one particular community's relationship to policing um, in the context of policies like stop and frisk. Um, and so we're just going to, um, I'll, I'll interrupt this and um, take you into uh, a slice of the project when we had our first um, action, sort of public uh, pr presentation uh, of, the, of the data back to the community. Do you have a question? Sure. It was the Morris, uh, she asked me to repeat the name of the project, and it's the Morris Justice Project. All right, let me call that up. Okay, so um, so this this short clip was actually created not by the project, but by a um, a collaborator. Um, we partnered with this group called the Illuminator. I'll explain a little more in a little bit. Um, we had an opportunity um, to. Um, partner with these activist artists who sort of were born out of Occupy Wall Street and who run around the city now and, and parts of the world projecting uh, injustice and speaking back, uh, literally taking spaces on buildings um, with this, like, uh, like the bat signal, right, um, from years before. At any rate, they partnered with us and helped us project our data um, on a public housing building one evening uh, last fall. We surveyed over a thousand local residents to study police in the neighborhood. Over the last year, the NYPD made 3,920 police stops that's just in our neighborhood alone. 
90% of those stops were neither given a summons nor arrested. In other words, they were innocent. And we're a group of community members here and around these blocks and also uh, university professors and lawyers and the Public Science Project and we've come together basically to study uh, experiences with police and the stop and frisk and attitudes towards police in this neighborhood. And this was our first presentation to the community of the, of the findings of our survey that over a thousand people took. So we wanted to introduce it to the community, let them know what the survey that we took that we gave them and they filled out for us over a thousand surveys. We wanted them to know the outcome of it. As a group, we created a presentation which was projected from the Illuminator. Also, Julie Dresner's documentary from the New York Times was filmed and the Community Safety Act, we projected that. And so all of that went down just to essentially give back and feed back this information to the neighborhood. And for all those stops last year, you only recovered eight Guns? Don't misunderstand us. We're not against the police. It's how you police. The majority of the people that took the survey, like 51% were saying how they, when they were stopped, they were stopped to ask for ID. This is our home. We belong here. Please, don't treat us like we're strangers. We also had a question asking if there were ever called names and we had a fill and answer and they put in every name we can you can imagine and they were on it and and like she said it was several names so many racist names that was on that list that it was unbelievable it was kind of like it ain't too much gonna shock me because I live in the area but I was like kind of shocked about it myself this is our home we shop here please don't stop us without a good reason 67% of those who took our survey reported being stopped by the police. Part of what the survey showed is how much the community members here love their community, care for their community. Yes. And that they're not asking the NYPD to leave, they're just asking the NYPD to police differently. Right. We want, we want to be able to get along, you know. It's not like back in the days when you had Officer Joe who walked the block and was familiar with his neighborhood where he walked. His beat that he walked, he was familiar with it. Now we're not familiar with him, them, and they're not familiar with us. So we got to get a little bit closer. With something got to happen that we can communicate a lot more, some type of program that I can understand your job and you can understand that this is where I live at. The, the data that we shared tonight was from a preliminary analysis. Yeah. Um, we're going to keep working on it and keep working and sharing back with the community and uh, helping folks understand that their experiences with the police and um, the level of harassment and injustice that they're experiencing is happening everywhere um, and helping folks um, decide what they want to do about that and how we might work better with the cops so that and the police so that we can have uh, fair and, and just and respectful and responsible policing in the neighborhood, which is really what everybody wants. Yes, and I think we all deserve a little respect, you know? You have to give it in order to receive it. And I think we deserve that in any, any community, you know? We need them, we want them here, but we just want them with respect. And give us our dignity that we deserve. Dear NYPD, we are the Marvis Justice Project. We deserve fair and just policing. So that, that's just to take you into um, the space of what participatory action research looks like. This is um, after data had been collected and as, as I obsessed about in the interview um, was the preliminary data. We were a little bit panicked that, that um, you know, folks would go too far with what we were trying to, to share back and still continue to think through with the community. Um, but just to give you a, a little bit of the flavor of what happened and, and I'll backtrack a little bit to tell you uh, more about how how and where this project started. 
the Morris Justice Project um, is a grandchild um, of sorts of work um, that Michelle, that Brett Stout, um, who's on the faculty here at the CUNY Graduate Center in Environmental Psychology and um, at John Jay College in Psychology and Gender Studies, um, and Madeline Fox, um, another graduate student here at the CUNY Graduate Progr um, Program in Social Psychology. Um, and, and many other graduate students have been involved with projects on mass incarceration and growing up policed, uh, particularly here in New York City. Um, this project uh, grew um, in, sort of began in the fall of 2011. Um, Brett and colleagues were uh, made aware of this particular neighborhood from a survey um, called Polling for Justice. Uh, young people that took that survey identified this area um, um, as having um, incredibly high rates of negative uh, interactions with between young people and uh, police. Um, they were sort of off the charts, right, in this particular, a couple other neighborhoods in, in New York City as well, but this was one of them. Around the same time um, uh, that our interest was growing in these particular hotspots, um, uh, Brett Stout, my colleague, um, met up with Chris Fabricant, a lawyer um, at the time at Pace University, who was also very interested in, in what was going on, was representing some people um, in this um, Morris Avenue area. He introduced us to those families, um, to, to Jackie Robinson and Fawn Bracey in particular. They introduced, introduced us to friends and family and neighbors. Um, we had a couple of graduate students, Jan Haldepour and Lauren Dewey, um, who were hanging out in basketball courts. Um, laundromats, street corners, um, and after about a month of flyering and talking to folks, meeting the crab man who sells really phenomenal crabs if you're ever up in the South Bronx on 164th Street, 61st Street rather in Park Avenue, uh, crab man introduced us to Miss Pearl. Miss Pearl is 80 years old and lives in a building right near where he sells his crabs. Um, and never really leaves the house after dark because sort of isn't quite sure what the neighborhood will uh, reveal for her, although she has lived there for um, more than 30 years, um, raised all three of her sons uh, who are now grown there. Um, so we are currently about a team of 15, 12 of us who meet regularly on Saturdays um, in a public library on Morris Avenue. Um, uh, if you were going to look at us, uh, we are everything from Crystal, who's about 16 years old, to Miss Pearl, who I introduced you already, who's 80. Um, together, we are young. We are uh, mothers, uncles, grandmothers, uh, professors, graduate students, those who maybe are considering a GED. I'm not really sure. Um, we have lived in the neighborhood. Most of us have lived in the neighborhood for most of our lives. Some of us are immigrants. Um, one of us has only come recently to the neighborhood and is living in a shelter. I live in Brooklyn, Brett in the East Village. So we really kind of span um, in our differences. Uh, we've grown more recently over time. There's more graduate students who are involved, uh, Scott Lazama, Anat Manoff, and Hillary Caldwell. And then there's a few folks who, uh, the Public Science Project runs these critical PAR institutes in the summer times. And in talking about the work, there's sort of an infectious quality about it. And so now there are three people who <coughs> came up through our institutes that are now working with us. Um, and I raise all of these bodies and people and all of their descriptions just to sort of, again, illustrate this idea of what it means to have this kind of a contact zone where folks who don't normally sit next to each other are asking questions of each other's lives, of our collective climate. Um, so um, at our very first neighborhood, this was in the slides that you saw rolling before, what is a neighborhood, right? So our very first neighborhood, we brought in a, a big blown up Google map of the area and said, so where do, we, where do you hang out? Where, do you, where are the streets that you walk every single day? Where are the streets that you stay away from? Where do you shop, go to school, get your hair cut? So we started to map out. And we ended up with a map of 40 blocks that surround Morris Avenue that run from on the west side, Sheridan Avenue, which is one block in from the Grand Concourse, from anybody who's familiar with the Bronx, South Bronx, all the way over to Park Avenue, which curves up to Webster, from 161st to 167th. So it's a, um, it's a community, a very vibrant community, about seven blocks east of uh, Yankee Stadium. Um, we chose to meet at the library because 
there was a church who had actually given us some space and it turned out that the young men who were in our early meetings weren't comfortable. They liked the church, but across the street there was a building and a corner that was not a comfortable spot for them. So they wouldn't, they told us they wouldn't go to the church. So we hung out at the library. Um, just to keep again complicated, that neighborhoods are full of all kinds of spaces, right? Um, both cherished and uh, those that you avoid. Um, together, Michelle referenced um, research camps, right? You have in participatory projects, you have to think about and scaffold in ways for people to participate as equally as possible. Um, so part of that is sharing and exchanging knowledges. Um, and together, we discussed our experiences of policing, um, which you can imagine across us were really different. Um, I had only been arrested once. Most of the young men <coughs> had been arrested uh, two or three times a week for long stretches. Um, certainly mothers, there was a period where we were going up, again, every Saturday, every other Saturday, depending, and we would start a meeting, and the meeting would start with, you know, who spent what time at the precinct, how many arrests there were that weekend. We learned that Thursday nights there's a spike, um, and mothers tend to keep their sons inside. Um, we, as you heard, created a survey together after culling through um, NYPD data f and, and housing data and education data all for the, for the 40 blocks. Um, we crafted a survey that went out to 1,000 residents. Um, so that meant walking you know, in, around the streets, asking people to fill it out, translating it into Spanish when we ran out of Spanish surveys. Um, we, um, did uh, interviews and focus groups with mothers, with young people, with um, young people who identify as LGBT. Um, and then as we were starting to analyze um, um, and doing things like uh, stats in action, what Brett calls stats in action, which is a way of analyzing quantitative data, which often feels very scary to folks who are not comfortable with math, whether you're a graduate student, a professor, or someone who is thinking about the GED. Um, again, how do you scaffold in participation? One of the ways that we do that is through Stats in Action. So we took the survey data in SPSS form, projected it up onto the wall in the library, um, uh, and started to run cross-tabulations, right? So what are cross-tabulations? Um, we always have food at the meetings. I generally, how gender works, tend to go get the food. Um, so I was about to run out when we started projecting these and Brett started to give a run through for everyone so they would be able to read the output, right, crossing, looking at uh, two different, um, uh, so looking at, you know, how stops are by race and gender, for example, two different variables at the same time. Amazingly, in the 20 minutes it took me to get sandwiches for everyone, um, I came back and folks were not just you know, bumbling along, but really asking questions of Brett so he could run, just rerun the stats. And so in real time, they could say, okay, that's by race and gender. What happens if you factor in age? What if you look at location? What if, and so, and keep running those. So it's, so people in our, our whole team is actually engaged in analysis of the data, right? But I should tell you, before I left, Nadine pulled me over, who's one of my colleagues in her 50s, and said, Maria, are we going to be doing this all day? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, you know, remember we talked about this is stats in action, this is how. All right, I forgot my glasses. And she lives in a fifth floor walk up, so she wanted to know if we were going to be doing, if it was worth the run back <laughs> and hiking up the stairs. By the time I'm back, she's already, not only does she have her glasses, but she's like glued to the wall, because even with your glasses, you know, it's not. So she's glued to the wall, and she's like, like taking charge of the whole thing, right? Um, um, <laughs> moments like that, and really, it, it's, it's just very exciting to think about what's possible in really a very short amount of time, right? It doesn't take forever to do some of this stuff. What it takes is a sort of the theoretical commitment to the idea that people have these capacities, um, and then the practical commitment of then how do you, so they have the capacity, then how do you create a space where they can engage that? Um, okay, so the illuminator that you just saw. Um, we had run into him before. He had actually contacted us about wanting to do some work on stop and frisk. 
we thought this was going to be a project months and months away. When we had all our data, we were ready to talk to the world. Um, they were running out of money. They had been funded by Ben & Jerry's. Ben & Jerry's was pulling the plug. Um, actually, it was Ben, so if you want to write an angry letter. Um, so um, uh, they were like, if you want to do it, it's now or never. So we went back to the team and said, we have this opportunity. Um, our, the, our colleagues in the Bronx, very few of them actually had been involved in Occupy Wall Street or really knew what it was about, um, and, although everybody knew Ben and Jerry's. Um, and, but the idea of projecting our data was so exciting and so beyond what we thought would be possible that it was too difficult to pass up. So we said, let's do it. We had huge, huge ideas that over the span of two weeks shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Um, and we just really put together a PowerPoint that was just a simple PowerPoint that took the, the, what we felt was um, sort of the, the most concise version of our strongest data. Um, and what was really interesting, and this is sort of hits back at some of the issues that Michelle raised around circuits, around the right to research, around, um, around counter topographies, um, that the idea that, um, and, and, and moving between individual lives and larger systems and structures. So we tried to craft, craft something that in two minutes would take the data from a survey that took all of those principles that she outlined seriously. Um, and would hold those at the same time, right? So would talk strongly about the injustice, that there were 3,920 stops. That's what we thought at the time. Actually, after we finished cleaning all the data and removing all the question tabs, the number has now risen to 4,882. Um, we, had to, we had this realization over the holidays when we just finished all of our cleaning of our data and at our last <laughs> research meeting, uh, Jackie, who you saw at one point talking about Officer Joe, uh, she's been playing in the lotto 3290, uh, or 3920 rather. So she's like, oh, now I have to play another number. <laughs> so um, you can use these numbers in all different kinds of ways. Um, they are both uh, strong statements of injustice and potential uh, millionaire winning. Um, and, anyways, um, but, but actually that's another illustration, right? It's about 90% of the people that we surveyed were stopped in the area, or rather, of the people that were stopped. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, let me rewind that. Okay, so um, of all of the people that were stopped in the neighborhood, of that 4,882, 90% of those people were innocent. Okay, by innocent, I mean they were neither given a summons or an arrest. Nothing happened. There was, I mean, after they were stopped, potentially frisked, potentially thrown onto the ground, called all kinds of racist names, right? During that year of uh, 2011 when we interviewed folks, eight guns. Right? We have since um, learned that those eight guns were retrieved from six stops, and one of the stops had a group of young people, and three guns were reported from that stop. But after looking at all the police data, we're starting to notice patterns where large groups are um, all being arrested, um, or, or that guns are counted for each person, and we're starting to wonder in these group stops if there really are the same amount of guns as there are. You can arrest people for possession even if it's not theirs, but you can't count it in the police data, right, that you've recovered that many guns if there's actually only one. So anyway, so, we're, so there's somewhere between six and eight guns, but even still eight guns for that, for nearly um, 5,000 stops is a little extreme. Um, but how to hold these 50% these of the people who were stopped, there was physical force involved. How do you hold that and at the same time hold that this is a community, right? That this is our home. And that this is our home, that, that we shop there, we pray there, we you know, raise kids there. That all came from the, the qualitative data um, that we had coded all together. And so that those were all statements that people were saying, yes, this is happening, but this is also where we live. And this is a place we don't want to leave. This is our home. Um, that night when, when, when the research team was yelling the data into the microphone, the big ideas that kind of had to shrink a little bit, one of them was that we thought we'd have this great soundtrack, and it turned out we all had to yell into a jerry-rigged microphone. Um, but there was something really powerful about people yelling the data, the voices, the experiences of the thousand people that had taken that survey, right? How that was then becoming a reflection back to the neighborhood embodied in their own children's stops, in their own personal 
you know, uh, interactions with police. Um, and, and their call for not, for no policing, right? When we talk about this work outside of this community or communities that have been so impacted, the first thing people say is, why don't people leave? And why don't they just tell the cops to get out, right? People don't leave because it's their home. And they don't want, they remember what it was like when there was a lack of attention from the police. That's not what they want. They want to enact their citizen rights, right? They want to be safe in their neighborhoods. They want to feel protected. They want to feel people, that there are people that are responsible to them. Um, you know, as they say over and over, they want policing with dignity and respect. All right. I just want to dig into a little bit about um, the idea of this being their home. We engage a lot in community analysis, so we've gone back to the blocks with the survey after this. A lot less glitzy. We have things like uh, flyers of, um, uh, not flyers. So we went back into the blocks in the same way that we went out to survey folks with the survey and then with a sort of a flip chart of different items and then the results to have folks help us interpret what we're doing. So we have a participatory team that's doing that all in a collective fashion and then with Within these 40 blocks, we're also doing it again on street corners. So we ran to one local politician who, after looking through this, was like, well, of course, we're living in a police state. You know, we're, we're refugees, he said, in a camp. They're always watching. Um, we've been funneling this data um, to, um, right now, it's a very, as you probably know, for those of you who live in New York City, and if those of you who don't, it's happening in, in cities across the the nation, unfortunately, um, that uh, there is a lot of organizing around stop and frisk and other aggressive policing practices right now. There are some very large court cases um, that are in the federal courts. Um, in New York City, we have something called Communities United for Police Reform, which is um, 80 organizations from lawyers in the ACLU or NYCLU and um, um, the Center for Constitutional Rights, Bronx Defenders, to community-based organizations um, and activists and academics. Um, uh, so Brett is Brett Stout and others are taking our data and funneling it into that group. It's also <coughs> being funneled into the lawyers. So there's re it's very exciting to think about the work that our our project did is really actually moving right in, into very important hands, hopefully. Um, but um, but even more importantly. Um, we're thinking about ways of infusing it back into the neighborhood, right? And again, I had started to say that to unpack a little bit what it means that this is our home. Um, how, and when engaging in this kind of work in local communities, how might people respond differently if they were able to see their lives in the collective data, right? Um, the right to research informs every level of participatory processes. Our co-researchers who live these stops have a deep understanding of the criminal justice system, of, of um, the policy of stop and frisk and all of its consequences. Um, and, and we operate knowing that this knowledge is valued equally alongside, you know, Brett and others' mastery of the NYPD data. If people have the right to ask important questions of their lives and experiences, and they have the right to answer those through research, um, they also have the right to respond. And what these kinds of projects can um, do is something what Martin, um, Ignacio Martin Baró talked about, surveys as social mirrors. And so in some ways, the Illuminator event was a dramatic um, uh, example of that. Um, folks literally were throwing down signs from their windows um, about stop and frisk. You know, folks who were not a part of the project who were just res responding to the, um, and reminding us that if we, in taking this data, now as the co-researchers are taking this data into the blocks um, and giving people an opportunity to see their own stories, their own experiences stop and press, their friends collectively in the data, um, there's all kinds of possibilities for action um, or for, you know, for, for mobilization beyond just in, in addition to the lawsuits. Um, so we've been starting to think about um, how to engage the number of 4,882. Um, we have, we took a trip to the Bronx Museum on Saturday um, 
and started to see whether or not that might be a space for us. Um, it turned out that it didn't feel so hospitable, um, although there was a lot of ideas that percolated. Um, we started to, th to think about community barbecues, of block parties, of movies, of vans that would rove around and make t-shirts that had the number emblazoned on the front, and then this is our home, or we, you know, we raise children here on the back. Um, the, the, what's interesting about some of the ideas that have been coming about is that it's not just about um, nice community collaboration or, um, or just all of us getting along, but it's more about a funda fundamental belief in human rights, human potential, neighborhoods, generations. It's listening to, um, um, it's listening to people's assertion that this is a community and that these policies are are taking are sort of um, disrupting that right? They're they're making it impossible to be a community when you're under when you're living in a police state, basically. Um, so just to to sum it up, since we're running a little bit out of time, um, that I think one of the, the the powerful aspects of participatory work, when it's engaged through critical theory, through history, through power is that it demands work that, as Caitlin and others and Michelle said earlier, is in constant motion between individual lives, collective practices, and larger social political systems and structures. And that informs each stage of the work. And it holds us both responsible to policy, um, to producing new and useful knowledge, but also to our relationships to each other. Um, and um, not just the relationships themselves, but the dynamics that are happening between them, and then what those teach us about how those dynamics are produced. Um, so I think I'll end it with that, and we can entertain questions about yeah. anything that's percolating in your bodies and minds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> so first, just. For everyone who's in the room, questions, thoughts, comments, provocations? Yeah? Sure. So um, the question was, um, as outsiders coming into this neighborhood, um, did we get resistance? Yeah? So, um, I, so what's interesting is that um, we didn't experience a lot of resistance. Um, we did run into people who were concerned about what it would mean to do something that was counter to police. Um, and to policing because the, the police have such a powerful influence in the neighborhood. Um, but I think the reason that we didn't get resistance was because of how we positioned ourselves. So while it was true that we were outsiders, so the first four people that um, were sort of roaming around, uh, myself and Brett and then Lauren and Jan, the two graduate students that I mentioned, uh, didn't live in the Bronx. Um, that's that was just one piece of who we were and how we introduced ourselves. Um, we, we actually first entered um, into the neighborhood to meet Jackie and Fawn. So it was through a relationship that they had with someone who was already working on issues around stop and frisk, right, and defending them um, or launching a, a defense. Um, they then introduced us to other folks, and so we started to form networks and relationships with people. Um, and then we spent time, like I said, in, in public places where people were hanging out and saying things like, hey, we're a group of researchers, we've done a lot of work, we, worked, we talked about polling for justice and um, how that led us to this neighborhood and neighborhoods like this, that we wanted to continue working, that we were really outraged about um, aggressive policing and we wanted to um, work on that. and. You know, were they interested? We were thinking about launching a community research project for folks who never heard about research. We explained what that would be, and were, were you interested? And so then we had a community meeting, um, talking about it, giving examples of our work. Um, and so I think because it was, we were sort of coming in solidarity, and we weren't coming to study on, um, I think that makes a big difference. Um, 
at, at this point, there hasn't been any um, large scale change um, around policing. Um, but the fight is really just beginning in the spring. These court cases, I think, are going to make a really big difference. Um, I can just tell you that the night of, but but our alliances do matter, um, for better or for worse, revealing how things are so unequal um, in terms of treatment. The night that we were shut down, there were, I think, uh, three paddy wagons um, that the police brought, um, as they do when there are things going on. And when we were processing the event afterwards, um, together as a research team, the the it didn't come up in the beginning, but then by the middle of our discussion, people were laughing about how it was the first time, those of us, African-American members of the team were laughing, it was the first time that they'd ever been in the Bronx where three paddy wagons rolled up on the scene and left empty. Um, and the police did shut us down, and there was a big to-do in that process. Um, and um, you know, we had talked about a plan, how to keep people who were, who were more vulnerable um, out of harm's way, you know, being so confrontational, not really wanting to be confrontational with the police, but might potentially being read that way. So um, we joked, Brett is a, is a very white, blonde person, male um, person, and so we had a plan that he would be first arrested, um, and then we, you know, in dealing with both the, um, the reality of, of, of racism and structural racism, um, the, you know, we, we, we joked and, and also the, both the, the reality and, and meaning the pain of it and then also just that this is where we are and then how do we leverage our power with each other. We sort of had a, a, a ridiculous joke that we should, you know, shrink him, co photocopy him and shrink him down and have people carry him in their pocket and that that would be, a, you know, in the meantime it would be, a, yes, it would be like a, a witness or protection against the police. Anyways, Michelle was going to say something. I was just thinking about time, and maybe would it be useful to oh, popcorn, popcorn up yeah. some questions, and then we can respond. Uh, yeah. The, you know, this is a high drama example of yes. a piece of work, but I, I don't even know if we had any funding for like no. the, these are not. Uh, there's something kind of magical about these. Usually, we're really deeply partnered with community-based organizations. Here, it kind of grew. But um, work that rides on the waves of community outrage and desire and possibility yeah. can be really magical. I don't know. Uh, and so suddenly all these other people, and it didn't really feel like invaders going to the Bronx. It felt like groups of people, and then they took these data to courts, and then they're working with young people in Brooklyn who then come to see the Bronx Project, so people get to understand this isn't just in your neighborhood, this is all of our problems, this isn't, you know, you're paying a big price for it, but, so should we popcorn up some questions mm -hmm. and then? They're already hands. Yeah, I see okay. quite a few. Yeah, Go. and then I'm gonna ask we'll Matthew if you see Twitter questions coming in. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks. Hector, you've been waiting. So why don't I take one and four, and you take two and three, and I'll say what they are. Is okay. that good? I'll, you'll say all four. <laughs> I'll say all four. So Hector, who's clearly been thinking about things since last I saw him, um, is interested in the extent to which PAR might be changing how we think about dissertation, scholarship, co-researchers, publishing, etc. It's the first question. The second is... What do we do with our own theoretical or political positions when we're doing participatory work, particularly, for instance, if you think there shouldn't be police and a community is saying we need to be protected? A third is, what are the variations? Have there been conversations about different forms of policing? And a fourth is really, how do you get concrete about identifying the ways in which privileged communities are either benefiting from inequality or are off the hook for their for their own problems while we're all focused on the problems in low income communities. So I'm gonna take one and four and you take two and three. Mm -hmm. Good? Is that all right? Great. Um, so you know we've been doing participatory action research here for ten, fifteen, maybe, maybe longer. And it has as I said earlier, part of what we're doing is excavating a history in psychology and geography and anthropology and in sociology. And so people like Margaret Mead, people like 
Jane Addams, people like W.E.B. Du Bois, and they all had co-researchers. Sometimes they were listed as co-researchers, <coughs> Margaret Wormser mm -hmm. and... Claire Seltitz. Claire Seltitz were doing community surveys all over the country, you know, looking at how many firefighters are white and black and Latino. Um, Margaret Wormser, Wormser was a housing organizer, right? So there is a history of doing this. It just keeps getting shed. The kind of neoliberal academy sheds its progressive selves. And part of our work is to remember, like excavating cemeteries, right, the work that came before. People vary in, uh, there have been dissertations that where there are, there's always a co-publication, but there have been dissertations where chapters are co-authored. There have been, you know, Caitlin's work has involved young people, has involved a website where everybody gets authorship. Alexis Halkovic and I have just finished a project um, with a group of co-researchers on uh, formerly incarcerated college students. We're all listed as researchers. There's a website, there's a report, and there's a publication coming out. So it might be that one of the chapters in her dissertation will, will reflect that. So I think, I think the, the borders on what constitutes objectivity as opposed to strong objectivity Right, Sandra Harding's notion that strong objectivity is lots of different people sitting around saying, I see it this way, you see it that way. How do we make sense together rather than acting like there's some fantasy of outside, detached, or neutral? The, the back end question on how does one begin to look at the privilege side, that's hard work. One of the privileges of being privileged is you don't get research very much. And you've got all these privacy protections Right? So when poor, when poor kids are picked up for drugs, they go to the police. When rich kids are picked up for drugs, they go to the psychiatrist. Right? So, so just whose data are low-hanging fruit are already classed and raced. So a big piece of our work is, for instance, Brett is thinking about looking, comparing community in the Bronx and the East Village. Very differently policed, but in one year had equal numbers of guns picked up. So why are there 5,000 stops in the Bronx and many fewer in the East Village when in fact, if the task is to be identifying guns, we're getting the equivalent, right? So whose communities are suspect and whose communities are um, assumed safe? I've been doing similar work with many colleagues on education. When schools are closed and then reopened for another crowd, particularly in gentrifying neighborhoods, or the ways in which charters are moving in to kind of clear out low income or English language learners or not so well performing students and then get replaced by high performing students. Why it is that in gentrifying neighborhoods now, white communities are calling for community control. It's a funny little reversal on history. Um, so it is our work to really be drawing those connections, but also creating allies, yeah. right? So that Folks, folks in the student debt movement are being joined with folks in the college for prison move, in prison movement to understand the redlining of higher education, right? So part of the privilege of higher ed, it seems to me, is to create unsuspecting allies, to allow people to understand we are all endangered if the commons is endangered, and that struggles that look like they're separate you know, wealthy parents who want good schools and low-income parents who want good schools, and they all hate high-stakes testing, right, to understand that they've got some shared interests. And it does seem to me like the privilege of our distance enables us to see the points of overlap, but it, it's not as apparent as, uh, and there's not a lot of funding to study pathology in wealthy neighborhoods, as you might guess. But there's plenty of pathology. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to uh, share a couple of things, um, piggybacking a little bit off what Michelle just said and also recognizing that I know you guys did some readings that, that you want to have a good conversation about and so we don't want to chip into that time too much longer. Um, but just a couple of things around, um, so Michelle mentioned strong objectivity and uh, earlier argued that contact or participatory contact to be more specific um, uh, sort of then enables a stronger validity perhaps, right? Um, so part of engaging a critical participatory process or project um, is 
attending to those very um, those very inequalities, right? So looking at the Bronx and the East Village, right? But part of the critical participatory project is not just to do that because I in my office or me in conversation with Michelle was like, oh, we should really, you know, you should really counterbalance. You know, it's not just coming from theory. It's coming from how you're seeing that theory operating in the conversation in the group. So to get to your question a little bit and, and to yours too, um, the, who talked about different different kinds of policing and then different frames, you know, um, respectful policing versus no policing. So we had a lot of, I truncated it, but we had a lot of complicated conversations about people's experiences of policing, both the overwhelming uh, oppressive experiences and the bizarre enactments of, a structurally, uh, of structural racism within the police department, right? So I ha have only been uh, picked up by the police once it was a rescue mission. Um, I was walking um, on like a hundred and I don't know, thirty fourth Street or something like that, crossing town, crossing from the east side to the west side to go to Columbia University. I was like nineteen. I was picked up, and um, uh, the two officers yelled at me. F it, it's until I got into the car. It was like ten o'clock at night. I was a little freaked out. Didn't know what was happening. Get in the car. They tell me they had rescued me. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and long story that follows that, but that's a very different experience, right? It's, they were taking what they saw as a white girl and saving her from the streets, right, of Harlem, basically. Um, so we had a conversation about that being my only experience, other than in demonstrations and protests, and their daily experience. And not just, wow, isn't that different? But what was about that? What were the, what systems are in place that, that is, that's happening, right? And not uh, Manoff, who's just joined us recently, and this is the last example. Um, she uh, is um, an, is studying here from Israel. So she, but has done a tremendous amount of work. She's a, an architect and done a lot of work around design and art active art activist um, work. So she's come into the project, and when we were at the museum, um, so sort of percolate all of our, our ideas around different I different ideas of policing, how to use, how to think about research and activism in the arts to help you know, shake up and, and take abstract ideas and, and bring them home. At any rate, she brought in this example of, um, it was a, a photograph of an army tank that's used as a police be, policing vehicle in Israel, in Palestinian um, neighborhoods to enforce the curfew. So this police vehicle goes around and blares out that it's a curfew and everybody needs to get inside. Um, they have, these art activists have taken a photograph um, in real scale, attached it to a shopping cart, and they've taken that into plazas in Europe, fancy plazas, and b through a boombox, um, basically set off sirens and said, it's a curfew, everybody has to go home, sort of enacting what happens daily in, in, his, in um, these Palestinian neighborhoods in Israel. So as she was thinking about presenting this to the group as like, look, here's another example, you know, she was a little anxious about, about just importing Palestine into the middle of the South Bronx, you know, what, what was she, was it just her agenda? So she was raising a lot of really interesting critical questions about, you know, the, the ethics of doing that, of is it recolonizing a space even though you're using another marginalized population, all really interesting questions, right? But in the space of a critical participatory project, if you're thinking about things like counter topographies, it opens you up to reposition that to be another you know, the, the women who were living in, the, some of the moms who were living in the neighborhood were immediately responded to that as very similar to what happened in the, their neighborhood, right? So it was a, one deep look in one country, another deep look in another country, and all of a sudden the circuits were, were visible, right? And so we could have a different kind of analytical conversation about what was going on and some activist ideas around maybe we should go to the Upper West Side and and either we as a team or get some allies who are maybe more comfortable doing this, and we should go up to people and stop them at mi mimicking the same um, frequency of stops that are happening in highly surveilled neighborhoods. Um, you know, to both, we are researching those neighborhoods through citywide data, but maybe we should also have them feel an embodied experience of repeated stops. You know, so those are two examples of how to sort of negotiate those kinds of things, but always rooted in the data that the research is collecting and the conversations that people are having. That 
creates a shift. So that these aren't imposing agendas. These are the agendas that people in the research team have and are operating from. It's, the, it's their histories that they're bringing in. It's their analytical lenses that they're operating under. Even when they're not using the same language, part of our job is to help, is to help folks communi communicate across their languages and to help reveal through that what, you know, the many layers of what, what we're talking about. Anyways, thank you. We're going to be happy for you to stay, but the camera's coming off. <laughs> And Lori and Hector, we're going to give you a very short string here um, because I know you came prepared to facilitate some conversation about readings and how they might connect with what we've just heard. And so I think in about 10 minutes, 12 minutes of all of us trying to make some connections is what we ought to try to do now. Um, and we'll let you all start off. What do you see as some of the connections between what we've just been listening to and the readings? And just to say one other thing to build on what Wendy said, to say this is, so we're doing this in our physical space and these discussions will be continued on our blog posts, um, on our website, so for everybody in our, in our virtual audience, so thank you.